Well, good morning to all. I found out something this morning. I found out that if you live long enough, there's always something new that you haven't experienced before that's going to happen. I'm driving here from up the Coppola New Galley Road, and uh, a big old hawk on the right side happened to desire to come out of the tree at the right time, come in front of me, and almost on the ground, and then saw me and swooped up, but didn't make it. And he came and he hit off the hood of my car and smashed against my windshield, completely winged open. I thought he was dead. I couldn't see. And I was wondering which one of us is really going to be dead in this situation. But here he's kind of, you know, slumbered back to life again. And he swooped down on the left. I slowed down to see if he was okay. And then he was on the ground a little bit and he flew off. But never had that happen before in my life. Now, if that was a turkey, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> But uh, God is good. God is good. I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you enjoyed last week's service? Amen. Yes. Amen. How many of you have taken notes from last week? A little bit too loud here. How many of you have taken notes? Amen. It would do you well to take notes. Because right now, and I'm just now finding this out, that all over the country... There are ministers that are talking about discipleship. Because obviously the Holy Spirit is really thriving on the subject matter. Yes. That it's time to become a disciple. Amen. Now, if you thought last week's sermon was okay, this week, this week is going to be phenomenal. I really believe that the information that the Lord has shared with me to give to you today is beyond anything that I have been privileged to ever preach before. And it would do you well to have notebook in hand and pen in hand that you take the notes as necessary because a lot of the things you're going to hear all have everything to do with what God has desires for we as a church and you as a people. Amen? Amen. And so with all that said, we're going to get right into it. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and I praise you. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in our home, Father, what you're doing in this assembly, Father. And I know that, Lord God, that you are doing some shaking and some awakening, Father. Not only within the contents of the, the confines of the people that are here, but even in their households to the extended family of where they're at, Father God. And I'm praising you, Father, because I know that we are living in the last few hours. That, Lord Jesus, you are about to return. And I really believe that we are going to be, some of us are going to be alive to see your face as you come back for your bride. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. <coughs> well, this morning we're going to be talking about God's plan of creativity. And I want to show you this morning how God forms His purpose in a person's life. Now, if you don't know what your purpose is, if you don't know what God has created you on earth for, I guarantee you God has a specific yes. way amen. of getting your attention where you are going to have to have no ability to hear anything else but His voice. Yes. He will bring you to your knees. He will bring you to a very droughted area where He's going to be able to speak to you. And it's at that point you're going to know for sure who you are in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And once, if it be the case that He has your undivided attention and He can speak to you and let you know what it is that He's created you to become, if that be the case, and you begin to walk in the influence of that call, that destiny, then you're going to realize that the power that God has provided you and the miracles that you are showing other people, you will realize that apart from God, you would never be able to do the things that you are doing at that moment of time. I say that because I want you to know that all of my childhood, my parents were on me because I could not look people in the eye. I could not speak to them. I was introverted. I was absolutely shy. I held that shyness about me until the age of 34 years of age. I couldn't look at people. I didn't want to dare get in front of an audience of people. I always wanted to hide. I didn't want to be in the front. But when God spoke to me and told me what He wanted me to do, He equipped me. He equipped me with a boldness. Amen. And when God speaks to you and tells you exactly what He wants you to do, He's going to equip you with boldness you, and with authority. He's going to equip you with revelation knowledge. Amen. Some of you probably know what I'm talking about already at this moment of time. So this morning, we're going to be looking at a man 
who was really a mess, more so than any one of us. We're going to be looking at the life of Jacob. And uh, Jacob, as we know, he was a total mess. He had done anything and everything totally wrong, and he thought he could get away with it. Well, the Word of God tells us in Isaiah chapter 43, starting with the worst, first one, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. There are three things that will take place with God's plan of creativity. First, He creates, and then He forms, and then He transforms. And in your created state, God sees the potential that is inside of you. Why? Because God placed it there. But in your created state, God sees that you're not ready to manifest what he's created you for. So he puts you on the potter's will and he begins to form you and mold you and shape you into what it is that he has for you. Amen. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, the word of God says, let us make man in our image. Everybody say image. image. Underline it. Write it down. Very impacting word. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So first you must understand you were created, every human being has been created in the image of God. Amen. It doesn't matter who they are. Yes. They have been created in the image of God. But not every human being is created in the likeness of God. They haven't been formed into the likeness of God. Why? Because they have chose to reject God, reject His Word, reject His Spirit, reject being in His presence, and therefore, they have taken on the formality of the world and of the nature of Satan. That's why you find that so many people that were created in the image of God are thieves and robbers and murderers and rapists and what have you, because they were never formed into the likeness of God. But when God had created you and I, He created us in His yes. image. Amen. And the word image is the Greek word logos, which means an imprint. You were an imprint. And so as an imprint, you can do nothing. Because an imprint is nothing more than a baby. And all a baby can ever do is make a whole lot of noise, and they goo-goo and they poo-poo. That is all a baby ever does. A baby can't do anything. And so what God has to do, He has to take us, and He has to mold us. I'm going to give you an example. When, I was found, when we found out that we were going to have our first child, my oldest son is going to turn 50 here in a few months. Hard to imagine. But here, when, he, when we were told we were going to have a child, our first boy, our first son, and we, we also got notified it was a boy, my mind kicked into overtime. I, I perceived that this young little baby was going to look like me, look like the family, have the attitude and the ideals of the family, have our structure and have our gifts and our talents. That's how I perceived him. A lot of people said, well, I pray that it doesn't act like you, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, when we finally, when, she, when my wife finally went in to give birth, and they gave me this little being, when I looked at him, he looked nothing like what I had perceived in my mind's eye. I saw him as a finished product. They gave me a blob. They gave me a little boy with nothing but wrinkles all over him. He was matted. He didn't look anything like what I assumed he should look like. But what he was, he was a future somebody that one day was going to find his yeah. place in society. And yeah. I prayed that he would find his place in the kingdom of God. Amen. But because of the fact that he was a baby, he wouldn't even respond to our voice. He did nothing. He did nothing to thrill us that we had a baby. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so all we could do, because all he made was a whole lot of noise and a whole lot of mess, we continued to coddle him. We continued to nurture him, love him, contain him, comfort him, keep him warm, keep him fed. And one day he grew and grew and he grew up to be an adolescent. He became a representation of my mind's eye. All of a sudden, now you can see structurally in his face, he looked a lot more like the family. He looked a lot more like me. He, uh, he had gifts and talents, but they weren't sharpened yet. 
but he was a mess. He was a mess. He had some teeth missing. His <laughs> hair was long. His clothes were baggy. We tried to have conversation. He was talking from Mars. We were talking on Earth. We could not jive together. So what we had to do, we had to put some perimeters of, of rules and regulations in the household in order to keep him contained. And we kept on feeding him and clothing him and nurturing him. And he continued to grow and he grew from that of a representation. And one day he grew to the full manifestation of what it was that I saw in my mind's eye when we were told we were going to have a son. All of a sudden, he took on the entire formality. He was the full maturity of what God had intended for him to become. He went into the military. He had served for 20 years, retired. Now he has a job as an IT specialist at the uh, Pittsburgh School of Theology. He is well on his way. He has three beautiful children. He's married. They live in Pittsburgh. But I see... I see the results of what God had done even with my son, and that's what God does with you and I, because of the fact that we are, we are created as imprints. We are started out as babies, and God, even though he has put a potential inside of us, he knows that as an infant, as a baby, you can't do what God has intended for you. So God has to put you on the, the potter's wheel, and he has to start molding you, shaping you, forming you into that of what it is he's created you to become. We look at Jacob. Jacob, as you know, he's a supplanter. A supplanter means one who's trying to deceptively gain access to property that he has no ownership of. He was a supplanter. He was a liar. He was a, he, he was a, 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 a deceiver. And the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 1, I created you, Jacob. Now think about that. I created you, O Jacob. I formed you to become Israel. I created you, Jacob. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Did God create him to be a deceiver? Did God create him to be a liar? Did God create him to be a supplanter? No. But God created him like he created us as an imprint, as a baby. And as a baby, you have to watch that baby. Because as that baby grows up, that baby's going to want to put his finger in the, in the electric socket. That baby is going to crawl around and put stuff in his mouth that you don't want him to have in his mouth. He could choke, right? You have to watch over a baby. And so I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age, if you have not allowed for God to form you into that of the full manifestation of what he created you for, you are still, therefore, an imprint, a babe. And that's what's going on with, with Jacob. Jacob was a baby up until this late age of his life. That's why he was a deceiver. That's why he was a liar. That's why he was a supplanter. But we know, as the story went on, that God was about to form him from that of an imprint into that of the full manifestation of what God had intended. But it doesn't take only a short period of time. We want it to be a short time. We don't want it to hurt. We don't want to go through any scolding process. But I want you to know sometimes it'll take 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. It is all dependent on how true are you to hold on to the hem of the garment of God and not let go. Because so many people... They start out on a good note, but then they become as like the Corinthian church that Paul had said in 1 Corinthians, you're drifting. Mm -hmm. They drift away. They drift away from God. That It's not important to come into the house of God anymore. It's not important to read the Word of God. It's not important to pray to God. It's not important to go and tell other people that you are a changed creation. That's not important. So what happens is you remain an imprint. Yeah. Until God can get a hold of your heart, if you let him. Mm -hmm. If you let him. And so we come to find that uh, Jacob did allow for God to do just what God intended. He went from an imprint to a representation to the full manifestation of what God had intended. And he became the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel came from the very body of that of Jacob. And his story is so interesting because you can read it historically, but I want you to read it knowing that you can take your life and put your life 
right there in the middle of his story because his story is a pre-shadow to what God says regarding you and I. Amen? And you also find that Jacob was confronted with two women. Two women that were going to change his life. Those two women are none other than Rachel and Leah. Symbolically, those are the same two women that God has for us that we have to look at and we have to make a decision. Are we going to love one and deny the other one? Or are we going to deny the other, or love the other one and deny the one that God has for us? So the question I have for you before we move on is, are you going to marry God's desire and reject your desire for the moment? Or are you going to marry your desire and reject God's desire? That's the truth of the subject. I'm going to look at Genesis chapter 28. I'm just going to give you an overview. And uh, just stay with me, Tyler, because I'm just going to speak here today. In Genesis chapter 28, we come to find that Jacob did something very bad. He deceived his father. He deceived his brother. And uh, finally, he got found out about it. They found out that he was so deceptive. And, of course, his mother, Rebecca, was the one that helped him along the way. But when he was found out that he was a, a liar, a deceiver, a deceptor of, of sort, what's he do? He begins to run. He begins to run as far as he can from his father's house, and you find him out there hiding in a cave. Not only is he a liar, not only is he a deceiver, but also he's a coward. He can't stand uh, to, to be confronted with those who have found him out, just like so many people in the church. So many people in the church, they come to church, they look all holier than thou, but we don't know the reality of their, their private life. Because behind closed doors, some people, they are living a double life. They're doing things, getting into things and they shouldn't, that they shouldn't be getting into. But when they are found out, they don't want to come back to the house of God because they don't want anybody to, uh, to, to know what they're up to and they're ashamed. And so they too, they begin to run. This is where Jacob is at. Jacob had been found out. He is a, he's a coward. He's run away. And now... He has run away to the point where he's hiding out in a wilderness plain. And a lot of people say, Jacob doesn't deserve to receive a word from God. Jacob doesn't deserve to have a plan that God would have for him. And I know that that probably is in the mind of most people if you know the story. Because, I mean, Jacob is probably the most uh, unlikely candidate that you would think that God would ever use because of how defiant he was, how messed up he was. But I want you to know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, it says that God will use the foolish things of this world. Everybody put their hand up and say, that's me. That's me. Amen. God will use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. In other words, God will take someone who looks so ridiculous that we look at them and say, there's no way in this world, there's no way in this world God would use them. But what happens is, God will take that person that is so ridiculous in our eyes, and when He is done forming them, they will be a completely different, Amen. rearranged person Amen. at the end Amen. of their life. Amen. And here's what goes on. God speaks to that person, and God says to them, I am going to, I've called you to be a pastor. I've called you to be a preacher. I've called you to be a teacher to go into the school system. You are going to be my right-hand woman or man to let the people know that you and I are connected at the, at the heart string. Yeah, and, or you're going to be a missionary or whatever it is. And you go back to church and you tell people, you know what, the Lord spoke to me. I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to be an evangelist. People put their arms around you. And they love on you. And they say, oh, praise the Lord. And they're praying with you. But the moment you turn your back, they're laughing at you. They're mocking you. They're ridiculing you. Why? Yeah. Because they know your life. They see the present moment of your life. But the truth of the matter is, God didn't speak to them. God spoke to you. He shared the future of your life with you. And when He spoke it to you, His Word came in and germinated in your heart of hearts. Yes. And it's His Word, the seed that He puts in there, that's what's going to see you through. 
It's his word yes. that is going to change you. Um, You're not going to change you. His you. word um, is going to change you, providing yes. you hold on with God for dear life. Amen? Yes. Amen. That's what's going to change you along the way. And so we come to find that Jacob is in an absolutely lonely, lonely, broken, desert plain. And so in Genesis chapter 28, starting with verse 10, it said, Now Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now remember, Jacob has run away from his father and his brother. He has deceived them. But here he runs as far as he can run in a day. He's so exhausted. He's out in a wilderness, dry wilderness plain. And what does he do? He lays down out there in a desert plain, takes a rock underneath his head, and falls asleep. And when he does, then all of a sudden, a portal opens up from the earth to the heavens. And angels keep coming, ascending and descending before his very eyes. And it's at that very place where he is going to hear the voice of God with absolute clarity. I want you to know that when you run away from God, when you have rejected God, when you say, no, I don't want to hear it, God has a way of bringing you to your knees. Yes, he does. God already knows, as he did with Jacob, God knows before you were formed in your mother's womb, you. God has a specific moment, a specific time, a specific microsecond, if you will. He knows what he's going to do to bring you down, to bring you to your knees, where you are so, you are so downcast, you're not going to hear any other voices. He wants you to hear yes. his voice. And that's when, that's when he's going to speak to you and he's going to make sure that he has your undivided attention. Amen. Amen. So we find that he speaks to Jacob at this point. Verse 13 says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and south, and in you, everybody say, in me, in and in your seed, in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was the promise that God had given to, to Jacob at that time. God is trying to show Jacob something. He's trying to show Jacob, Jacob, there is something vastly important inside of you. You know nothing of. You see yourself as Jacob. You see yourself as a deceiver, a supplanter, a liar, <coughs> one who has been found out. You are ashamed. But I want you to know that's only because you are still an imprint. You are a baby. But I see the final result of your life. And in you, there is something magnificent Amen. that I want to use that is going to be a blessing to all the world. And so he was trying to get Jacob to see it and understand it. The hardest thing for God to do, if there's anything hard for God, is to get you and I to see ourselves the way God sees us. Yes. The hardest thing is for God to get us to have confidence in what God is saying, even though we look in the mirror, we don't see what God is trying to show us, but God is showing us there's something <coughs> definitely powerful inside of you that I'm going to use providing you allow me to start molding you and shaping you that one day you will become the person I created you to be. But in order that, for that to happen, you and I have to have total confidence and faith and trust in God and not in ourselves. Amen? Amen? But let me tell you something. You better believe you better believe if you are going to be a, a disciple. You better believe that God has something that he's going to routinely change you into, mold you into a whole different person than what you are right now. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Amen. And let me tell you something about this church. 
I believe that if we will believe the way I'm trying to show you, because this is what the Lord had shown me, God is going to bring this church to a multifaceted level, level yes. like we've never been before. Amen. God yeah. is going to use yeah. this church yeah. to bring signs, yes. wonders, and miracles yes. Yes. to the Tri County. Yeah. God yeah. is going to bring many Amen. people to their fit, to their yeah. knees, yeah. and their Lord. hearts are going to be changed yes. through the makeup yes. of many people that are still going to come oh, into yeah. the house, and they're going to get changed, Hallelujah. and they're going to get delivered, and they're going to become yeah. the people that God yeah. intended. You say, "Well, yes. how does that be?" Praise Look at Lord. us. Yes. We are so weighing, weighing, uh, weighing as far as population. I want you to know that God is going to use in this last hour small yes. churches Hallelujah. just like this. Yes. Why? Yes. Because God yes. wants to get the glory. Yes. And if God uses a large church that has thousands of people in it, most likely they will get the glory. So God is going to use us. How's yes. He going to do it? Amen. He is going to take you and take you from that of being an imprint and then he's going to start molding you and shaping you yes. so that you will recognize what is inside of you. Hallelujah. And once it is birthed, then all of a sudden you are going to realize that there's yes. something powerful that God has. Thank and you'll you, hear man. his voice. Thank you, and the Thank voice you. of God that will come to you will be as like the quenching rain yes. that is coming and bringing a peace Thank into you, your God. heart. Amen. Yeah. Thank so you, God is going to take Jacob. He's going to use him because there's something inside Jacob that needs to be born. And once it's born, it is going to be effectively powerful and tremendous for all the world to be blessed by it. Hallelujah. And we know that Jacob went on to become the nation of Israel. Yeah. And the nation of Israel has been a blessing to all the nations of Amen. the earth for the most yes. part. Amen? And so God has something inside of us. And until it is birthed, until it is birthed, then what God has placed inside of you that will be a blessing Amen. to others. You may not see it. You may not see it in your lifetime. You may pass away. But if you are obedient to God, holding on, and allowing Amen. Him to mold you and go through this process that He needs to bring you through, then what is inside of you, once it is born, others that are coming behind you will be blessed as well. Amen? In verse 15, we find that God says, Behold, I am with you, Jacob, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. This land that you see right now, Jacob, that you're running away from, to you, it is a land of defeat. You never want to come back here again. But I want you to know that when I'm done with you and I've rearranged you, you are going to see this land in a whole different perspective. This land is not going to be a land of defeat in your eyes. It will be a land of victory. Hallelujah. Amen. So that verse 15 again, I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you. Hallelujah. I will not leave you until I have done this that I have spoken to you. Thank you In other words, he's saying to Jacob, I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go because I, it's my responsibility to change you Amen. into another man, into the man that I've created you to become. Your responsibility is to stay true to me. My responsibility is I have made my word and I've, I've roped my word, tethered it, into a covenant. What I said to you that I will do, I cannot break my word. I will not leave you. I will not let you go. Thank you, Lord. you can let me go and you can be deficient of my plan. But if you hold on to me and allow for me to do what I want to do, oh, I want yeah. you to know that if you don't drift away, I am going to follow through and you are going to be so excited to yes. see the man that you're about to become. Yes. So verse 19 says, Then Jacob called the name of the place Bethel, which means house of God. Then Jacob made a vow. And he said, If God will be with me, if God will be with me. Now, he's a deceiver. He's still a liar. Okay? And he says, but, but he's in this place where he wants to make a covenant with God. Now, God has to take <coughs> Jacob and do whatever God has to do to get Jacob to fall in love with God's desire. Because if Jacob doesn't fall in love with God's desire, then this whole game plan for Jacob is going to be null and void. Jacob will not become the nation of Israel. Amen? So God had to 
ultimately get Jacob to fall in love with his desire. Verse 20. So, Jacob made a vow with God. He said, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on. In other words, all he concerned himself with. You see that he's a baby. He just wants, his, he wants to be nurtured and he wants to be clothed. That's all he's concerned with, about. Even though God is telling him there's something inside of you that is far greater than anything you can imagine. Okay, God, but where's my food? Where's my clothes? That's all he was concerned about. Why? Because he's an imprint. He's still an imprint. Look at verse 21. It says, So that I came back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, understand, we're going to go, in the, we're going to go now into Genesis chapter 29, and this is where it gets very, very good. Now, for God to transform Jacob into that of the nation of Israel. He had to first and foremost, he had to put him through a process from an infant or a, a, an imprint to a representation to the full manifestation of the man that he should be. Only then could the, then God take him and transform him into becoming Israel. So God was saying, I'm going to take you from a supplanter to you're going to become Israel. Israel means a prince with God. A prince with God. And let me show you how it all works. Genesis chapter 29. Let's read verses 1 through 6. Are you still with me here? Amen. Okay. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by, for out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone, very important, very important here. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they, everybody say they, they. would roll the stone from the well's mouth and water, and from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, my brethren, where are you from? They said, we are from Haran. Then he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. So he said to them, is he well? Now I want you to go down to verse 9. Now while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Now, did you see anything there? I go back to verse 3. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now, all the flocks would be gathered there, and they, a group of men, was needed to take the stone and roll it away. But now... We come to find Jacob is pursuing forward to do what God is intending for him. Do you remember the promise? In me, and in you, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He's looking for a wife. He said, okay, if God say I'm going to be blessed, I don't understand it, but I'm not married. I need children. I need to find a wife. He sees Rachel. He's gaga over Rachel. The Bible says she was beautiful in form and in appearance. He loved her tremendously. And because he was now moving in God's perfect will. Amen. Follow me here. Remember what I told you last week? God, Jesus Christ said, all authority that has been given unto me, I give unto you. He's not talking about Christians. He's not talking about ordinary Christians that have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. If you got saved, if you accepted Christ, you are on your way to heaven. But you could live like hell on the earth. And no, none of your prayers will be answered. Because when Jesus said, all authority that has been given unto me, I give unto you. He was talking about 
those that are disciples becoming disciples and also becoming disciple makers. That they are absolutely, absolutely going to the next level with Christ. Amen? Amen? So that you see here, because Jacob is moving forward in God's will, a supernatural invasion of strength came upon him. And it says here that he moved the stone himself and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. That's what you can do individually when you are Amen. growing into that of becoming a disciple. How do you know you're a disciple? He, Jesus said, if you are obedient to my word, then you are my disciples. Yes. You can be a Christian and not even know the word of God. So many Christians that don't know the word of God. But there are so many that do. I spend time with Ron. I tell you what, he's a walking, talking encyclopedia yeah. of the Word of God. It puts me to shame sometimes. I'm telling you, there are people that know the Word of God. You need to know the Word of God. Amen. I don't mean to bring shame to you, but that's just the truth. Okay? So, what happens here? Jacob wants to get married. I need to find a wife. He sees Rachel. He says, Oh my goodness, look at her. She's gaga. She's beautiful. He's whistling. And then he wants to know, who's her father? He goes over and he's hugging her and he's kissing on her. Yeah. Mind you, this is a different time. This was his cousin. And so he's looking for his Uncle Laban. He goes to his Uncle Laban and he says, what can I do to have Rachel as my wife? And his Uncle Laban said, you worked for me for seven years. Yeah. You can have her as your wife. He worked for seven long years and he finally gets his wife, Rachel. And the Bible says that those seven years went back, went by like a few days because every day he had the chance to spend with Rachel. Now here comes the day of the wedding. The day of the wedding, the culture was that her face would be veiled. He would not be able to see her face. They had the ceremony. They had the time where there was a festivity in the, in the city. And after it was all said and done, when the darkness of the night came through, he had already added on to his Uncle Laban's tent. And now he was going to now take his beautiful bride into that tent. They were going to consummate the marriage. And they went and they did just that. In the early morning hour as the sun was coming up. And the sun was starting to shine through the little cracks, nooks and crevices of the tent. He must have maybe leaned over. He wanted to give his new bride a kiss. Now with her unveiled face, he was about to kiss who he thought was Rachel. Here the great deceiver was deceived. He wasn't given Rachel as his bride. He was given the older daughter, Leah, yep. as a bride. And I can only imagine, he probably wrapped the towel around himself, come out of that, that tent screaming, looking for his uncle Laban. He wanted to fist fight. He wanted to know, why did you do this to me? Now Laban, understand, was also a deceiver. And his sister is that of Rebecca, who is uh, Jacob's mother. So the whole family has a problem with deceiving people, right? But you have to also recognize that J uh, Laban gave the older daughter to Jacob first, and that was Leah. And he explained it to Jacob that the older daughter has to be married off first before the younger daughter can be married. But the other reality of it all is that Laban became an ambassador of God, giving uh, Jacob God's desire. He had to receive God's desire before he could ever receive his desire. So here he is. He's married, thinking he's married to Rachel, but he's actually married to Leah. And he hates Leah. Matter of fact, verse 17 says, Leah, her eyes were delicate. In other words, she wasn't all that good looking. I don't want to say it, but she probably looked a little bit like a dog. He, he hated her. He wanted nothing to do with her. Let me tell you something. When God has a plan for you, Amen. when God speaks to you, and God tells you what you're really created on this earth to do, and He shares with you the secret of the potential that is inside of you, it doesn't look good. Most times, you want nothing to do with it. Most times, it is the most unlikely thing you ever want to do. That's why Jesus turned around and said, pick up your cross and follow me, yes. because it's a hardship. When God spoke to me and said, I want you to travel, and I want you to travel for the next 20-some years, I'm telling you, it was a hardship. When all of you were probably at home Monday through Saturday, 
uh, not Sunday through Sunday, I should say, and you had family, you had children that you were with, I was living out of a suitcase by myself, lonely in an empty uh, hotel room, and I would be there for sometimes two weeks at a time. The only social activity that I had was when I went to church in the evening, and everybody was excited that I was there, that when everybody left, I was back to loneliness again. When my children were playing ball, football, baseball, whatever it was, I wasn't there. I missed a lot of it. You know why? Because the call had me tethered. I couldn't quit. There were many times I said, I want to quit this, Lord. I want to be normal. I want to be like everybody else. And God wouldn't answer my prayer. He would just keep giving me revelation knowledge and send me out. Give me another plane ticket. Send me another place to go to. And I went there for 28 years. And it continued, and it continued, and it continued. When God speaks to you, the call that you have designed on your life, that you will find out, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't, it, it's not a very uh, loving thing that you're going to say, boy, I can't wait to do that. No, you don't really care for it. And so you come to find Leah was God's desire. Jacob wanted nothing to do with it. He, does, he did not love her whatsoever. So he goes back to his uncle Laban, and Laban said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you Rachel's hand in marriage right now, but you have to work another seven years. And so that's how it was. And then you come to find, over here in verse 31, it says that Rachel's womb was barren, but Leah's womb was open. Leah's womb was open. So here's this guy. Jacob doesn't love Leah, wants nothing to do with Leah. He has his, his eyes and his heart fashioned on Rachel. And this is what I want you to start writing down. You come to find Leah then begins to birth children for Jacob. The first child that was born, his name is Reuben. Reuben, all names in the Bible have meaning. Reuben means to see. All of a sudden, Jacob began to see a bigger picture of what God's intention was, which opened up the second child would be born. The second child born, some of you are not writing, you're not going to remember this, so I hope you listen to it again when you go home. The second child's name is Simeon. Simeon means to hear. Now, Jacob was able to hear with clarity what God was saying to him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. And because he had his eyes open to God's desire and faith now uh, surrounded him, now he fell in love with God's desire, which brought forth a third child. The third child's name was Levi. Levi means to be joined together. Jacob joined his heart together with God's desire, Leah, and now he fell head over heels in love with her, and that allowed for a fourth child to be born. The fourth child's name is Judah. Judah means praise. Now together, as husband and wife, they began to praise the Lord continuously together. Leah felt loved for the first time in her marriage. And they were praising and worshiping God. Now the whole time, here's Rachel, who is Jacob's desire. She's moaning and complaining because she can't have children. But it wouldn't be until Jacob fell in love with God's desire that God would then yeah. open up the womb of his desire. Yes. And you come to find that now Rachel bears two children. The first child's name is Joseph. And we know that Joseph became the head of all the patriarchs. You read about him. He was second in command throughout the land of Egypt. He was the one that had the vision. Seven years of drought, seven years of plenty. And there Pharaoh put him in charge of, of providing all the, the grain to be given to all the Egyptians and all of the outsiders of Egypt that they would come in and pay money for the grain during a time of heavy drought. People were starving to death. That's who Joseph is. But then there's a second child that Rachel gives birth to. 
the second and final child is Benjamin. Matter of fact, she giving birth to Benjamin, she died at that moment of time of giving birth. So I wanted to show you something here. Again, remember the promise? In you, I, let me go back a little bit and say, he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac, and you will have all the land will be given unto you from the east to the west to the north to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now here it is. The fourth child from Leah is Judah. Through the tribe of Judah came Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, the Bible says, first and foremost for all of the Jews. He came primarily at the moment for the Jewish people. But let me show you what God will do when you fall in love with God's desire, how He will take your desire and He will applicate it, that your desire will also be part of the program. Because now you come to find the second child born of that of Rachel was none other than Benjamin, little Benjamin. <laughs> Through the tribe of Benjamin came Saul of Tarsus, who would become Paul. And Paul would notify us over in the book of Colossians, for the mystery that had been hidden for ages and generations past had now been revealed unto me, that he would be the one that would go and propagate the gospel truth about Jesus Christ to all of the Gentiles. You and I are not Jewish. I don't believe that anybody here is Jewish. We are Gentiles. A Gentile is anyone that's not Jewish. And we are here because of Jacob being obedient, allowing for God to process him from that of an imprint to a representation to the full manifestation where God would be able to transform him from a supplanter to that of Israel, the entire nation of Israel. Amen? Now, I have given you, I have given you six children that were born. And it's wonderful if you just want to receive it and say, oh, that was good stuff. But those same six boys, God will birth in you if you will allow for him to transform you into that of a disciple. That he wants disciples. Christ is looking for disciples. Amen. Go into all the world. Okay? Go into all the world and yes. preach the gospel Hallelujah. to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father yes. and the Son and the Holy Hallelujah. Spirit. And he wants disciples. He doesn't just want Christians. He wants disciples. I can't emphasize that enough. And we're going to continue on that vein until you get it in your heart. Hallelujah. Just being a Christian, coming to church once in a while, that's why you're praying and praying. And your prayers don't get answered because there's no authority given to you. None. And that's also why so many Christians are suffering and dying prematurely. Because they're not in obedience to the discipleship program that Christ wants. Mm -hmm. When you become a true disciple, it doesn't mean that you won't have anything, yeah. but it won't have you. Amen. You will be able to whisk it, whisk it away oh. by prayer. Your prayers will be answered. Because of the Amen. fact that God has given you, by the power of His Son, authority. Yes. Supernatural innovation of innovative authority will come your way. Yes. Amen. But My those six God. children, those six children will be, will be birthed in you when you want to become a disciple. When you are hanging on, the first one that will be born will be Reuben. All of a sudden, your eyes will be opened, and you will see a bigger picture of what God has intended for you. And you will see yourself in a whole different display. You won't see yourself the way you see yourself in the mirror in the present moment. God wants you to see yourself in the future the way he has created you that you will one day become. Which will bring forth the second child that will be born in you. And that will be Simeon. Now all of a sudden you will have faith. Not in you, but you will have faith believing in Christ. Yes. You will trust him because he says, I have tied my word to a covenant. What I said I will do in you, I am going to do Amen. it. And because you have fallen in love with God's plan, and you're not going to let go of Jesus Christ, you're going to let him bring you to a place of discipleship, Hallelujah. then you're going to find that there's going to be a third child. A Levi is going to be born. You are going to embrace the call. You are going to Hallelujah. embrace the call of what God has 
plan for you. Amen? Amen. And then you're going to find that now a fourth child is going to be in you. It's going to be birthed. And that is Judah. You are going to be praising the Lord. You're not going to be denying the call. You're not going to be rejecting the call. You're not going to be saying, this is too hard. I can't do this. I don't want nothing to know. You're going to be praising and worshiping and honoring God. And then a, then a fifth child is going to come. And the fifth child is going to be Joseph. And that's the powerful yes. one because, see, we didn't talk a lot about Joseph. He was the head of the patriarchs. Because once you know who you are in the kingdom of God, you yes. are going to recognize that you are in leadership role. You are not going to be the head of the tail. You are going to be the head. You are not going to be the old. You're going to be the new. You are not going to be the last. You're going to be the first. You are not going to be the borrower. You are going to be the lender. That's who Christ has for you. Amen? And then finally, Benjamin is going to rise up. You're not going to be able to close your mouth. You're going to go to the highways and the byways. You're going to propagate the gospel message. You're going to let people know Jesus Christ is coming soon. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Because he's coming for a church without spot, without blemish. doesn't mean he won't be perfect. It doesn't mean it will be perfect, but the blood will will be stained yes. on you to show the perfection in the eyes of the Father. Can you say amen? Amen. And last of all, you come to realize that Jacob, when he was completely transformed, he came back to the land. And when he came back to the land, in that very location where he had seen the ladder going up and down, he came back and he wrestled with God. And he said, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. Yes. Not God not only blessed him with a new walk, a new talk, but he gave him a name change. Um, he gave him a name change. He said, I'm no longer going to call yes. you a supplanter. I now call you Israel. Mm -hmm. You are a prince with God. Yep. Amen. From that point yes. on, you will come to find from that point on that never again did Jacob look over his shoulder worried about who's coming and who's going to hurt him. He saw the future you, and he saw himself within the, the midst of the destiny of that future. And when his brother Esau came, when his brother Esau came, that was the, that was the compromising time because he thought maybe Esau was going to kill him because he did deceive him, did steal from him. De Esau turned around and bowed before him and said to him, my brother, he said, listen, I have more than enough, but when I look at you, when I look at you, Jacob, I see the face of God upon you. Hallelujah. When you are divinely transformed, Amen. you're not going to have to say a whole lot. People are going to see the relationship yes. you Amen. have with Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You say amen with me. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Amen. Let's just give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Let's just thank you for supporting The sad thing is, some people think religion is the foundation of salvation. It is not. When you, came, when you come to think about Jesus coming, he went against the religious leaders. He said, you brood of vipers. You put heavy weights on others that you yourself can't, can't carry. Jesus is not looking for religion. He's looking for relationship. Yes. He's looking for a continual, intimate relationship. Yes. Yes, Lord. If you have a problem here this morning, if you have yeah. issues, you've been praying and praying and praying. Some of you weren't here last week. I would advise you to go back and listen Great. to the sermon last week about discipleship, what Jesus says about it. Because honestly, yeah. he wants this church to be a church of peace. Yes, Lord. Peace you. in your heart. Yes, Lord. A church of victory. That you are going to be an overcomer, not to be yes. an overcomer. Amen. Amen. He's looking for disciples. And yes. can you imagine? Jesus. If you truly take what you hear and go out and practice it and applicate it, yeah. all the all the church uh, 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 the uh, the chairs that are empty will be filled. Amen. And we're not looking to fill our church. We're looking to yes. fill the kingdom of God. Yes. Amen. That's what we want to do. Amen. Fill the kingdom of yes. God. So don't go out of here and say, well, that was a good message, a good sermon, whatever, and forget what you hear. Look at your notes that I've provided to you and recognize that's what God wanted you yes. to hear this morning yes. because he's about to do something yes. sensational yes. in your lives. Yes. That's why he wanted you to hear the stuff you're hearing. Yes. 
He's about to turn things around for you. But it can only happen. He's giving you the key. It's up to you to turn the key and open up the lock of heaven and therefore allow for the power of heaven to saturate you that you, when you pray, it, all the things you're asking for are going to come to you. Amen? Amen. Why would you want to go through life from this point on and you be the tail and not the head? But God doesn't want that for you. God wants Amen. proficiency. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, before we close, if anybody is hurting, sick, you want prayer for anything, I always leave it open. I'm also going to do this before we have a, a time of prayer. I want you to just close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to thank, first of all, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for what He has done for you thus far in your life. But if there's anyone here, and I know that you're all saved, but if there's anyone here that is in a backslidden state, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. You're in a backslidden state, and you need to get right before God. I want you to just lift up your hand and put it right back down. I see the hand. Anyone else? You're in a backslidden state, and you want to get right before God. The people in Florida, many, many, many lost their lives. They didn't believe that they would lose their lives at that microsecond of time. You don't know when you leave here what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to be allowed to be on the earth to be here during Wednesday Bible study or to another service. You don't know what God has as a plan for you. So make things right, right now. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to pray with you by laying hands on you. I'm just going to pray an open prayer for you. And I'm going to ask one more time. Is there anyone here that you need to get your life corrected before God? Just lift up your hand and put it down. Okay, let's pray together. Let's just say this prayer together. Father God, Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you always give more than enough chances. More than enough chances. Father, I haven't been completely obedient. I haven't been completely obedient to your word. To your word or to your will. To your will. I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you forgive me. And as you did with Peter. And as you did with Peter. Put me back on the path. Put me back on the path. And set me forth. Set me forth. On a continuous. On a continuous. Path that I can provide for you. Path that I can provide for you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I ask that you not not leave me nor forsake me. I ask that you not leave me nor forsake me. That you would carry out your will. That you would carry out your will. In my life. In my life. Bring me to the place, Bring me to the place that, I will be a true disciple. that I will be a true disciple. And therefore, I can be a disciple maker. I will be a disciple maker. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Now again, real quick, if anybody needs prayer for sickness, whatever, I want to pray with you. If there's anyone here, please come to the front.